Hello everybody and welcome back to Guided Hacking. Today we're going to be discussing Blackguard Stealer, a stealer which was awarded the worst stealer of 2020 to 2022 award by the developer of Calibri Loader, which you can find my blog post here. Today we're going to be discussing why it's got this award and what makes it so terrible. Let's not waste any time and get straight into it. So Blackguard was sold on an underground Russian forum where a lot of malware is sold. It reported to steal stuff like cookies, also fill the history of a browser, wallets from the desktop, Steam, Discord files, along with stealing from wallet extensions from browsers, stealing from FTP programs, Telegram, and so on. And it was sold for $200 a month or $700 for a lifetime license. And it was written in .NET, already off to a bad start here. The seller of the malware claim to have developed it with anti-reversal features uh, using XOR for encryption. Probably not a great idea to put in the string encryption into your sales thread, especially for researchers like myself. This really saves me a lot of time when I look at it, along with anti-sandbox features and a Bitcoin clipper, which I mean, sure, why not? At this point, let's do that as well. Um, along with when you purchase the build of the malware, you will also get a panel to view your logs from your victims and the people you've infected. Uh, here's the login page as can be seen here. And then when logged in, you can see the panel itself with all of the infection statistics. This is clearly a example of functionality of a form. It looks terrible. I guess if it does the job, who can complain? Although we're going to be looking at the panel later on because it is just as bad as the malware itself. Speaking of the malware itself, let's get to reversing it. Well, the binary is written in .NET. It's as easy as just opening it in DMSpy. The build I have here is not packed, so we can just open it without having too many issues with reversing it. And when opening the binary in DMSpy, we see all kinds of information on the left here of all the functionalities that the malware has. We can see lots of classes with different functionalities, such as stealing from Edge here, stealing cookies, stealing from Chromium, and some other stuff. Again, mentions of credit card information, file manager, file seller, and so on. I'm gonna concentrate on a few things that I find interesting, and then we'll just go on to discuss why it's actually so terrible. But let's chalk one point up for it being written in .NET because that in itself, not the best of ideas. So we'll start off our reversing here with going to the main of the malware. And we can see that there's a few checks here for tick counts. This is probably just to bypass emulators. It goes on to check if the malware is already installed by getting the file path of where it will install itself and also getting a process name and current process to check if it's already running. If it's not running, then it's just going to exit. Then it's going to do two checks here that look like they're anti-reversal checks. Let's look at these two checks. So this one is called is DN spy spelt wrong run. So I'm guessing this is just checking for DN spy and it's just checking here with this function, the environment variables and looking if the file exists. But we run into their first attempt at trying to hide the malware from reverses and hindering malware analysis techniques. So we have some encrypted strings. But because it's .NET, it's as easy as just clicking on this decrypt function and we can just read through how it's trying to decrypt the strings within this malware. Of course, with every single crappy .NET malware, we see the classic from base 64 string to start us off. You know what? I'll give them one point for at least not using just base 64 strings because afterwards they initialize this memory stream and they initialize a gzip stream which will then be used to decompress the base64 decrypted string. This isn't very difficult for us to decrypt, but you know what? It's better than just having a base64 string. So if I take this string and I put it into Cyberchef, we'll be able to decrypt it pretty easily. So now that we're in Cyberchef, we can just paste in the string and we know that initially it'll do the base64 decryption or decoding. So we'll just do that. And then we also know that it will use gzip to compress the string. So we'll then also see if Cyberchef has a gzip function, which usually it will. 
do we can just use guntip here to find that it's app data because this function was checking if dnspy is installed so it's going to check app data and we can check the second string here and i imagine the second string will probably just be dnspy and yeah it is so it's just checking if dnspy dnspy.xml exists within app data and the next one checks if it's in a debugger it's going to start with initializing a variable of ticks with the current date time then it's going to sleep for 10 seconds and and if the date time of ticks minus the ticks done is less than 10 seconds, then it's going to return true. So basically what this is doing is if somebody skips the sleep or if the sleep took longer than expected, then it's going to return true. Now I'll show you a quick trick as to why .NET anti-reversing techniques never work. So to show that they never work, I'm just going to go on to edit method and all I'm going to do is just select this and I'm going to click delete. After doing that, I can just save this binary and then run it in my debugger and I don't have to worry about those checks. Looking at the main functionality of the malware, we see all of the normal functionalities that you'd see within any generic stealer, such as stealing from wallets, stealing from VPNs, Discord, Steam, and so on. This is nothing new. Then it'll take all of that information, put it into a bunch of text files, put that into a compressed zip file, take those bytes and get ready to send it to the C2. Sample that I have here, it's using Telegram as a C2. This is quite common because some actors don't want to bother with uploading their files to a panel and having to host the panel themselves. So they'll just use Telegram instead. So looking at this functionality, we can see at the end of it that it'll send a post with a URL. Hovering on that URL, we can see where it's defined and we can see that it's this massive concatenation here. This is probably the content of the message being sent to the C2 channel. And at the top of this concatenation, we can see the API URL. Again, it's using the stupid base64 with gzip encryption. So we can take that and put it into our Cyberchef instance. And we can see that it is in fact the API telegram URL. Looking through some of the strings within here, we also see what looks like a GIP link. So the malware will request this link to get a IP of the victim and it'll concatenate it into the XTOL message. Scrolling down, we go on the post here and we can see it setting up all of the string formatting for the HTTP request to the Telegram API where it'll send the exfiltrated data. So something interesting about Blackguard Stealer is that if you run it within a sandbox, it's not going to be detected as Blackguard Stealer, it's going to be detected as 44 caliber Stealer. 44 Caliber Stealer is a open source stealer that is published on GitHub. It's just an example stealer. Obviously, it's shared for research purposes, but we all know it's just malware being shared. Um, and this even itself was based on a different stealer. So you can see with all of these .NET stealers, they're just copied and pasted from other sources. And we know it's copied and pasted not only because of the detection, but if we look at the source code of 44 caliber stealer, we can see some of the function names here, such as Proton VPN save, Discord write Discord. We go into the decompilation of Blackguard stealer and we can see the same, Proton VPN dot save and Discord write Discord. So already just from these function names, which the malware developer didn't even bother to change, we know that it's just a simple copy and paste. It also has some information copied from a stealer that I talked about in a previous video, which is Storm Kitty. Storm Kitty is another one of these stealers where a lot of people will copy and paste the source code from it and then resell it as new malware with the same functions that they're all sold with. The code that was taken from Storm Kitty is actually the code that we looked at previously, which is this connection to the Telegram API. This is all from the Storm Kitty code. So after looking at the crappy code, I've moved on to the panel. Now this panel source code was nicely shared by VX Underground and within it, we see a few files such as a file that gives you the PHP info functionality, which not a great idea. You don't really want to expose all of the variables and settings of your PHP instance, but you know, at this point, why not? Something that I hadn't mentioned about the malware is that it's already a massive binary. Its size is already 1.18 megabytes, which is huge for malware. But on top of that, it's also going to request 
SQLite DLLs from the C2. Again, a stupid choice. Looking through more of this panel, we get an idea of why it's just so bad. And as an exercise to the viewer, I'm going to look at the login page. And we can see this function here. It's going to get the login information and then it's going to send it to this auth function. If we look at functions.php, we can see the auth function. Let's concentrate on this auth function a little bit more. Now I'll give you a minute to take a look at this and maybe some of you who have looked at web security might be able to tell me why this is a bad idea. For those of you that don't know anything about web security, I'm just gonna tell you this is bad because it allows for SQL injection within the login and pass variables which are given by the user. So I could put in a SQL statement into here and I could just drop the database. I could just log in. That doesn't really secure the panel at all. But what makes this panel even worse is the fact that it is copied and pasted from another piece of malware like every other piece of code within this absolute garbage. On screen we have a excerpt from another piece of malware called Every All Stealer. Every All Stealer was from a few years back. It was another crappy C sharp stealer. And it came with a panel that was actually developed by the actor themselves. It wasn't a copy and paste. And here we can see a quick excerpt of the Every All panel, which is handling some of the C2 receiving of victim information. So keep this code in mind and then let's just compare that to the code within the panel of Blackguard Stealer. And we can see that it is just one-to-one. -one. And I think that's just some of the flaws with this malware. There are so many more that I could share, but honestly, I'm just going to leave it at that because my eyes hurt at this point. If you'd like me to look at more terrible malware, let me know. Next few videos, we're gonna be looking at something a bit more interesting, but I think this was a funny discussion as to why not all malware is great or well-written. So I hope you enjoyed the video and took something away from it. Until the next one, thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.